I'm Norman Robinson and welcome to Affordable Housing Matters. On today's show, we will visit with two organizations that are building homes in the greater New Orleans area. We will find out what building practices they are using and how these homes may be in your price range. We have a great show planned for you today, so don't go far. My early Alzheimer's diagnosis gave us time to adapt as a family. Phoenix Project NOLA's mission is to create transitional tiny homes for New Orleanians in need of housing with the use of energy efficient building materials. Their vision is to build a community of sustainable and environmentally friendly tiny homes for individuals transitioning out of incarceration. And joining me now is the executive director of Phoenix Project NOLA, Ms. Erin Marrero Savoir and Mr. Joel Holton of Grow Enterprises L3C. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Now, what is it about what you do that our viewers here at Affordable Housing should be informed about? Starting with Mr. Grow. Okay. Well, <laughs> one of the main things that we want uh, New Orleanians to know is that we need to truly start focusing on more sustainable healthier and climate resilient building practices here in New Orleans. Uh, just because of our weather, our heat and humidity, uh, pest and termites and mold and mildew issues, we want to be sure that we're using materials that are more resistant to those things that most affect the housing stock here in New Orleans. Uh, and industrial hemp and plant-based materials is where we look to go. It also improves indoor air quality. And we know that a lot of times indoor air quality is directly tied uh, to cognitive uh, development and learning. So we want to make sure our, our community members are having the healthiest, safest, most secure places to live. So you are with Grow Enterprises. Yes, sir. And so what is Grow? Why are you called, why are you called Grow? Well, it's kind of a little bit of a play on words because okay. of the plant-based material that we use, so we're growing uh -huh. things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also speaks to how we need to grow awareness and grow uh, sustainability, especially in our black communities. All right. And uh, Ms. Morero Savoir. Uh, you're with Phoenix. Yes. And what does Phoenix bring to this particular uh, project? So Phoenix Project NOLA brings the mission and the vision. I had a vision starting around 2017 to build tiny homes for people who were mm -hmm. unhomed or going through a transitional period and stage in their life. Um, mm -hmm. Whether they were a newly single mom, whether they were unhomed or coming home from incarceration, we all know that there's a serious housing crisis in New Orleans and there are not many affordable options and there were not any options where people were focused on developing new houses, especially in a tiny home market. As Joel just mentioned, I had a big focus on making sure that the houses were environmentally friendly, friendly and that they were good for people to live in and that's where we partnered up through meeting. So how did you partner up with, with Joel? That's a great question. So we both are uh, Propeller alumni. In Propeller when, alumni. Mm -hmm, yes, yes, we participated in the Propeller incubators. I want to say he was a year before me yes. and I was a year after and he was able to come and speak about the materials that he was using and I approached him and we got to partner up and I told him my plan to build tiny homes and I just didn't have the right materials or the right support system yeah. and from there we just took our visions and merged them together. Now let's talk about this material. Mm -hmm. It is not traditional, no. not in the sense of what we think of traditional housing material in the United States, maybe some other countries yes. on other continents, but not, not, not this one. No. You're dealing with hemp. What is hemp? So okay. our viewers can understand what we're yeah. talking so, about. Yeah, uh, so industrial hemp is uh, used to you know, as a building material. It can be used for a lot of different things. But what we do, we use the interior woody core of the material, of the stem, mm -hmm. and we mix that with a, a lime, hydrated lime binder and water. And we mix it together kind of like a mortar mix to create like a, a insulation or a wall infill. So it's like a high performance uh, plant-based insulation material that is, you know, the thermal performance is through the roof, but also it, it brings the carbon footprint of the, of the actual project down. So we're not only going to use it as insulation, but we also will use it f for flooring. So we can use, there's a hemp wood flooring uh, out of Murray, Kentucky that we're planning to use. Uh, a good friend of mine, Greg Wilson, is the uh, founder of that uh, company as well. So, you know, just by changing uh, the insulation material and the flooring material, we've already lowered the carbon footprint of that project by probably 30 to 40%. 
Now let's talk about the, the, the product itself, hemp. Yeah. At one time it was a, a bugaboo in the United States. I think it was out it was it was outlawed by Congress in nineteen thirty seven. Yes, I believe so. Yes, and, sir. and it was put on the the uh, list of no nos for, for substance abuse in 2000, was it not? Yes, sir. So what changed? Why? Uh, I think the Farm Bill of 2018 was a major uh, catalyst for us to get back into the industrial hemp uh, industry. I, I, I think more than not, we saw other countries and other municipalities take full advantage of such a high-performing material. And that spurred a lot of the growth of the industrial you know, hemp industry, definitely here in the United States. Uh, when I first started exploring it back in 2019, there were really no domestic suppliers. Now we have three to five domestic suppliers here in the United States, and that's what I kind of waited on before I launched. I wanted to make sure that we were using uh, U.S. grown uh, industrial hemp and materials. Mm -hmm. And when you hooked up with him, mm -hmm. um, what were you thinking in terms of your tiny um, houses project? What I was thinking, I'm a mother, so I wanted something that I would feel comfortable with my kids living in. Mm -hmm. And he said, come down, come see the material, come touch it, come feel it. And it's nothing like the, the, the insulation that's currently being used. You can touch it, you can rub yourself on it, you're not breaking out, you're not having reactions. And that's what I wanted for the people I was building homes for, to be in a space that's safe for them, for their kids to live in, to breathe the air quality in. We know there's a lot of mold, moisture yes. here in mm -hmm. New Orleans, and our kids suffer from that, and it impacts them tremendously. So you're telling me that this, this particular material is impervious to mold? Highly resistant yes. to mold. Highly resistant. Yes, yes sir. Because of the lime binder. So it's, it's automatically antimicrobial, antifungal, just by the mixture itself. Mm -hmm. So it's a plant, you gotta remember it's a plant, so it deals very well with water, mm -hmm. and it also regulates humidity in the built environment. So that means things stay cooler longer, or things stay warmer longer, so it also uh, is, uh, it gives a lot less, uh, there's a lot less energy that's used in heating and cooling the building once you use this material as well. Now. Which has helped us merge because of the affordable part of it. Well, let's talk about the yeah. affordability part yeah. of it. How, how does it compare uh, the cost comparison with 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 hemp um, compared to traditional building materials. So it's definitely uh, more expensive on the front side. So we say maybe 10 to 15 percent uh, increased costs on the front side. But over the life of that building, your energy costs are going to be so much lower. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a client, uh, Ms. Dr. Angela Chalk, with Healthy Community Services. Mm -hmm. uh, we retrofitted her building in the seventh ward, and in the first 12 months, she's seen. Uh, over 50% decrease in her energy cost. So oh, really? You, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so this has the same effect that maybe a solar a solar panel would yeah, have. Exactly. In, in so terms she paired it. She paired it with her solar system. She has a solar system ah. at her house. So she's she's seeing the real result of both of those you know in, you know innovative ideas at use, and she's reduced her cost probably about 50 to 52 percent in the first 12 months. So. It, you know, the proof is in the pudding that these uh, materials actually perform and they work. And that's what we want to show uh, New Orleanians, that we have to start thinking outside of the box and more innovative to solve the issues that we have. I think everybody knows the issues that we have, but we have to start using, you know, new and innovative ideas to get there. So you want to use the tiny housing program specifically for people who are, are being reintroduced into society after being incarcerated? Yes, and so that's, okay. that's what we're working with right now. We're currently partnering with First 72, and this first home is going to be a part of their transitional housing program. The first home? Mm-hmm. All right. When is that supposed to be um, completed? We're hoping if everything goes well, we'll be done by Jazz Fest. So really? Yes. 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 Oh, that's right around the corner. Yes. Yeah. All right, so you, you're going to build 72 of these homes? Not 72. The organization is called First 72. Okay. We're so going to build one this year. Oh, you're going to build one this year. Yes. What, what's the, well, I mean, what's the plan? So after this first one, the proof of concept, like Joel said, we know that this is new to people in New Orleans. This is the first tiny home that is being built with this material here in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. We want to show people that this is something that can be done in a city that is sustainable and that is also affordable. Mm -hmm. From there, we plan to partner with other nonprofit organizations who do have housing programs continue to build and expand on their housing programs for them and then also we want to then generate and create houses that are 
a little bit better for folks to be able to then afford to buy. We know it's important for our people from New Orleans to be able to afford homes mm -hmm. and to become homeowners, but we want to put them in homes that have great material, that is going to be sustainable for them long term, and also I want to really make sure we're considering the cost effectiveness of it, which is why the partnership with Joel was so great, because I don't want anyone spending three to four hundred dollars a month on energy when they're already spending a lot of money to yes. get into the home. Mm -hmm. So we're tr really trying to make sure we're considering the long term of what affordable housing looks like for people in New Orleans. So let's talk about your 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 prototype. Mm -hmm. um, where will it be? Uh, and what's the square footage? Okay. I can show you where it's going to be. Okay. <laughs> so if you look right past the jail, it's actually going to be located oh, right behind right, it. Right here right. In, in Mid City. Right yeah. on the corner of South Perdido and um, well, no, on the corner of Perdido and South Dupree, it'll be right there. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be the first one. It's going to be 510 square feet, equipped with a full kitchen, a bathroom, a bedroom, a porch, so people are a able port. to come mm -hmm. out on. Um, mm -hmm. What yeah. else are we missing? Uh, that's the, the most of it, but you know, by being a one bedroom, one bath uh, home, you know, it's going to give ample space. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of times when people think of tiny homes, we I like to refer to them as micro homes. Mm -hmm. And we also see a, a, a really huge uptick uh, in urban areas of use of the tiny home for affordability, affordability reasons. Uh, in Atlanta, other cities around the South, mm -hmm. we're seeing that people are realizing that you may not need as much home as you think, but you really want to have as much home as you can truly afford. But over time, the lower energy costs, the lower maintenance costs from using these materials, uh, the increased indoor air quality, these type of things hold tremendous value that you really can't put a price tag on. Mm -hmm. The last few seconds, Ms. Morero Savoir, go to you. Okay. Um, what about the pushback on the tiny houses idea? Remember some years ago, people were really upset. Mm -hmm. They're going to build tiny houses in my community, and what are we going to have just this outlier refuge camp? Yes. Yes. So how did you get past that? So actually that's around the time where I did take a pause for the organization. I took a pause and I took a step back and I wanted to see what is the city saying? What are people saying mm -hmm. that they need? And the biggest thing that we continue to hear, like Joel has mentioned, is that we do need affordable housing mm -hmm. and we do need to know a different way to build houses here in the city of New Orleans. So even though at that time there was a large pushback, I've taken the time to speak with different people, explain the concept, explain mm -hmm. the reason, and explain how it is a benefit to the city and mm -hmm. since then people are now becoming a little bit more on board because I, they're more educated now about they're the more cost. educated yeah. about the the costs and how it impacts people long term well do keep us updated mm -hmm. I, I'm anxious to see how this is going to look oh, especially yeah. since <laughs> it's you know uh, the completion date is is drawing near oh, yeah. and we hope you'll come back to see us For thank sure. you all right thank, thank you. you so much <laughs> you're welcome right. Joel <laughs> Joel um, uh, Horton of Grow Enterprises and Miss Aaron Morero Savoir Phoenix Project. Thanks for visiting us here at Affordable Housing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. When we return, we will look forward and find out what the Home Builders Association of Greater New Orleans has in store for the year 2024. Don't go far. I am what hunger looks like in America. The Home Builders Association of Greater New Orleans is a professional organization representing the residential housing industry, serving its members and the community since 1941. Here with me today to discuss the past year's success and also what homeowners should look forward to in the year 2024 is Mr. Dan Mills and Mr. Shivers Nellen of the Home Builders Association of Greater New Orleans. And uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Shivers, you are the board chair yes. of the organization, yes. and, and Dan, and I, I feel like I can call you Dan because we, we've been hanging out for a long time together. Absolutely. Uh, you are the CEO. Correct. All right. What is the differentiation? Board chair? I'm actually the sitting president of the Home Builders Association. You are the sitting president? Yes. All right. And Dan, as CEO? So as president, you're elected, and as CEO, I work for the HBA to implement the vision that our directors and board are putting forth. Mm -hmm. And I was reading your bio, and it says, um, he's not your usual entrepreneur. 
there's something unique about <laughs> Mr. Shivers. So what is that, Mr. Shivers? Um, what makes you unique? Well, I think there's uniqueness within all of us. Um, but Don't be so modest. <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying for the most part, I think there's uniqueness in all of us. Um, I have a, like what you would say, a, a, a background that most wouldn't see as um, typical, mm -hmm. you know, to a person that's sitting in this position. So, you know, th me bringing that forward up front and them accepting me makes me, you know, uh, extraordinary, I would say. So, so you're broadening the horizon yes. of the organization. Yes, definitely. You're, you're so, bringing another mindset. Yes. Right. And being that I am the first African-American president of the Home Builders Association, you know, that also brings um, a difference to the organization, uh, which, in, which in my case, it would be uh, inclusion, mm -hmm. um, bringing some diversity as well, which we all need in the community. Why is that important as a CEO? You know, it's really important because we have a very large workforce mm -hmm. and it's, it is an important milestone that we have the first African American president, but we also have an initiative that Nellen and the directors have been working on just in general to increase diversity and that means the Hispanic population as well and we established for the first time a Latino committee and that Latino committee, you know, 30% of our workforce is Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity to put forth uh, 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 s services and programming that will support that community in their, in their native language. Uh, and that allows us to then provide education and business development, which will lead to higher quality and more affordable housing. And that's, that's all part of the whole initiative. It's, it's not your dad's old HBA. This is mm -hmm. now an, an organization that is reaching out to all of our community and finding ways to provide programming and a home for those communities. How do you see that working out in, in the long term? Um, I see it being great. Uh, the, older, the older generation that is there now mm -hmm. has basically led the way for the organization to be where it is today. Um, and with the younger generation coming in, we can gather the wisdom from them and then move the, the organization forward with the help of them as well, uh, being on the sideline, because I can always pick my phone up and call one of the older members that may have stepped away just to go enjoy his life. You know, he's put 30, 40 years into the organization and he don't want to be on the forefront anymore, but he's always a phone call away. So I do see it uh, having a great impact with the younger generation being a part of it. Is that, Im is that important now? I mean, I, I see a lot of things happening institutionally where there's been a disconnection between the, uh, the, the, the status quo and the younger generation, mm -hmm. where there is there seems to be a lack of communication. Nobody. I remember that I was talking with uh, Leah Chase once, and she was concerned about nobody carrying the legacy forward. Mm -hmm. Is that what you guys are concerned about? Uh, for the most part, I'm not too concerned about the younger generation because I want to be the voice of the younger generation, and I want to be the one to put forward the foot to step this um, organization into a different perspective, not so much of my own agenda, but to uh, encourage African Americans that they can also be a part of this uh, organization and not look at it as a racial um, thing to stay away from. Mm -hmm. has, that been a, has that been an issue? Has that been um, uh, a barrier, that, that um, perception that it, it is uh, an organization that is not open? I, you know, Leah hits a good point, and she's an icon of the of the of the community. That we have a graying workforce, like many others, the seafood mm -hmm. industry faces this issue, and, and many other industries, and certainly it is for us. So, reaching out to the youth is really important. Workforce development is really important. I'm proud of what Chivers has brought in because he really does have that ability to connect to the younger group that are coming in, and and we need to show 
individuals that there is a career and a pathway and a future in construction. You know, beside food, shelter is the number one need of the community and we need a workforce that can come in to do it. We have 600,000 unfilled jobs nationwide in residential construction today. Really? Mm -hmm. And so that drives up the cost of construction when you have a shortage of labor. So as we can do affordable uh, training for our young people like we have at the Build Strong Academy, mm -hmm. we can provide training, increase the number of people, and these are jobs that are paying $25, $30, $35 an hour, and they contribute to the physical construction of our of our city. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people in construction look back on two decades and they say, I built that neighborhood and I had a part of constructing, you know, this community and it gives you a seat in the community and it gives you a, a career that allows you to raise your family and it provides a fundamental need in our community. I remember you were talking about that the last time you were here uh, last year, the, the, the Build Strong program. Is that part of the highlights of, of uh, the year 2023, that it, program? It really is. You know, the Build Strong Academy provides a certification in carpentry. It's completed over 12 weeks. It has zero tuition through sponsorship with the Breeze Dream Foundation. Really? You only have to be 18 years old to be there. And uh, you know, Shivers has been involved with that. He's been out at the at the the some of the graduations, mm -hmm. um, and it's just it's an amazing program to get involved with. So how do you how do you find this program? That's, I guess that's the question some viewers would be asking right now, uh, especially those who have uh, youngsters or who may themselves be looking for uh, employment. So the Build Strong has uh, 16 campuses now nationwide, so they can be found from hbi.org, or you can just drop in on the campus on uh, Williams Boulevard over there in Kenner. Just drop in on the campus. Um, it's right off West Napoleon on, mm -hmm. Kenner, on, on Williams Boulevard. Stop in. They've got staff over there that will walk you through the program. You can tour the facility. It's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. So what do our viewers need to know about affordable housing? Uh, in terms of what the Home Builders Association uh, can offer? There's so many things going on. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face today is insurance, and those insurance prices have been hitting us, and the Home Builders Association has been working hard to address several factors that affect that, and part of it is resiliency, so we're trying to make sure that we're building better structures. Mm -hmm. There are other factors that are needed in reform that our new insurance commissioner is working on and that our legislature will work on, but the number one thing as home builders we can do is to build more resilient structures, and we're trying to find ways to do that, quality, and also provide the affordability. And when you talk about affordability, I'm, I'm looking at interest rates. I'm looking at the, you t you're talking about insurance, I'm looking at the, the higher in insurance costs. How do you get around that? Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? There's a great program that many people don't know that they can get a wind mitigation survey. And this wind mitigation survey is a third party person that comes in and documents features that have been installed in the home that protect it from high speed winds and can be submitted to your insurance company and receive discounts. So in 2008, they mandated discounts for wind mitigation, and there are many things like putting clips or putting uh, unbreakable windows or using architectural shingles or putting a resilient roof on, um, and these things can be documented. So when the insurance carriers decide if they're going to write business here, they need data to mm -hmm. base what their rates are going to be on, and we are lacking in data in Louisiana because we don't uh, do permitting and inspection on re-roofs. There's no municipal data set that tells the insurance companies how many roofs in our housing stock mm -hmm. have been replaced at a standard. And so that's a key objective that we're trying to produce. And uh, Jefferson Parish has started producing uh, permitting for re-roofs. Orleans Parish has begun this year. Um, and that's going to create a data set over the next five years that will attract carriers to come back in. So as State Farm looks and says, do we want to write new business in Louisiana? They'll be able to say out of the 200,000 homes, 50,000 roofs have been replaced at a resilient standard. 
So today, we know we replaced 50, 60,000 roofs after Ida, but there's nothing that says what kind of roof we uh, put on there. So we need a municipal data set to verify, a third party verification of the quality and resiliency of those roofs. And as we build our resiliency in our housing stock to around 20%, we'll attract those standard carriers. They're not afraid to write in hazard areas. What they're afraid to write is on property that they don't know the risk. Yeah, I was talking to um, uh, my insurance carrier, and and I was asking. I said, you know, why why are my rates going up? And he says, well, it's you know because of where you live, <laughs> particularly it's right. because you live in the state of Louisiana. And he said, but I tell you what, you can you can get um, an inspector to come out and 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 he says, do you have do you have um, uh, shutters on your house? I said, yeah. He said, well, if 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 you you can get an inspector to come out and look at your sh your shutters to see if they are, if they if they if if they're eligible, if they qualify for our our wind shelter uh, program, we may be able to get you some reduction. But I didn't know where to go. Yeah. I didn't know where to go to find an inspector. <laughs> and, and today you can come to HBA. GNO.org and on consumer resources we have a list of the licensed wind mitigation surveyors um, in Louisiana and you can call any of them and for a few hundred dollars they'll do exactly that. They will provide you with a certified report by a licensed surveyor uh, that you can then submit and it will document all of those kinds of wind mitigation features of your home. And they'll also tell you, and then you can contact members like Shivers and others within our organization to come and add those features to your home to get further discounts down the road. What kind of features, uh, Mr. Shivers, would I as a homeowner um, be helped by? Uh, first off, <clears throat> normally we would get a company to come out and install new uh, vinyl windows they won't be hurricane resistant windows so there's a fabric that they uh, have produced that would allow you to make that window hurricane resistant and it's actually cheaper than putting a hurricane resistant window in and it's a retrofitted um, fabric that you can send um, you, you screw seven inch uh, screws into the studs mm -hmm. of the out, outer perimeter of the window and then there's some uh, detached or detachable butterfly screw things that you can actually uh, use to remove or install the fabric in the case of the hurricane. So if I'm a viewer listening to you right now, I can pick up the phone and, and talk to you? Yes, um, you can call and, me and or you call can, you and you ask can, you. You can call me and if I can't give you the information that you need, I can direct you to someone within our organization that actually installs this fabric. That hurricane fabric is an amazing product. It withstands a two by four projectile at 20 miles an hour. No kidding. Yes. And it is installed at a cost of about eight to $10 a square foot. So for a fraction of those high impact windows, you can actually install this aftermarket on an older home and it's very accessible in terms of protection. So I live in a historic district. Am I gonna have problems with the, with, with the historic people? It's not on all the time. Yeah. You have the studs, oh, and if you put it like you would put plywood up, uh -huh. this goes on, and wing nuts hold it in place on those studs that are into the window frames. So it's not up all the time, so no problem in the history. I don't know district. if you remember the program where they had the plastic hurricane protection that they were putting on yeah. the windows. They have a wing nut, yeah. and you can remove and install. The, plast, uh, the, 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 uh, the sheeting is actually the same type of installation. I see. You can remove it and then you can install it. Okay, well it's great to know that you guys are accessible. Yes. And I'm sure there are a lot of viewers would have questions that they probably want to ask. Absolutely. So thanks to both of you for being here. Uh, Dan Mills and Mr. Shivers Nellon. Norm, always thank a pleasure. All right. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. That would conclude our program for this evening. We would again like to thank all of our guests for joining us and sharing valuable information with us today. And remember, if you would like to watch or rewatch any of our past episodes, please scan the QR code on your screen and it will take you to the WLAE YouTube page where you can view all of our programs at your leisure. I'm Norman Robinson and we'll see you next time right here on Affordable Housing Matters.